Hello everyone, hope all is well in your neck of the woods. It's a beautiful fall day here. We haven't had any frost, so our garden is still going. My flowers are still growing and the catbirds are still around, so I'm happy. You know, Brombird News has been running now for seven years, but we've never really talked about birding gear. Even though as a family, we never leave our house without our binoculars. So today we thought we'll give you a quick introduction to binoculars. If you're looking for your first set of binoculars, we recommend setting aside a budget of about two to three hundred dollars US. That will give you a pretty decent pair of binoculars. And now let me explain some of the numbers that you might see in the descriptions of those binoculars. So the first number is normally either 8x or 10x. So what is that? That's magnification. So if you look at the bird at a certain distance, if you take binoculars that are 8x, you will not get as close to the bird as the 10x, but at the same time, your field of view with 8x will be wider than the 10x. So sometimes, you know, if you're trying to figure out where the bird is, it is easier to do that with an 8x binoculars than the 10x. And also, if you have shaky hands, the 8x binoculars will be easier to hold. And now let's have a look at the second number. That's the size of the viewing objective in millimeters. So the bigger the number, the larger the viewing objective is, the more light goes through the front. But at the same time, the larger the number, the heavier and the bigger your binoculars become. So let's have a look at the two sets I have here. So that's my husband's, that's 10x30 minus 10x42. Two. You know, we go on a lot of hikes and my husband always carries a backpack with water and snacks for kids and the dog. So he didn't really want to have anything too heavy. That's why he has 10x30, whereas I just carry my binoculars. So I got 10x42. Well, I guess that's about it for today. If you have any other questions or if you want to hear more about birding gear, let us know. We'll happily cover that on other episodes. John Petrus feeds birds year round and he has a lot of birds. He's never had any wasp problems, whereas his neighbors who do not feed birds on a regular basis have had a serious wasp problem and a few nests on their property. So if he's wondering if his birds have been taking care of his wasps. John, it's funny you should mention wasps. My wife and I have been waging a constant battle, successfully I might add, to keep them from building their nests in four different gables on our house in Vancouver Island this summer. And we have a fair number of backyard birds on our property too, including chickadees and woodpeckers, both of which prey upon wasps. But with our feeders filled, they seem pretty occupied with eating the easy to get suet and peanuts. In researching this topic, I came up with a list of close to 20 different kinds of North American birds that include wasps in their diet, some of which are not likely coming to your feeders. The latter include kingbirds, yellow-billed magpies, house sparrows, starlings, warblers, catbirds, and wrens. But possibly some of them do use your bird bath. Interestingly, ruby-throated hummingbirds include wasps in their diet. All this to say, it is indeed feasible that your abundance of backyard birds could definitely make your property a no-fly zone for wasps. But I'm not thoroughly convinced that the occasional wasp at the stomachs of your backyard birds will prevent a swarm of them building a nest. There could be other factors. As for hornets, only two bird species appear to be brave enough to take them on, scarlet tanagers and purple martins. And while your birdhouse might attract some wasp-eating birds to your yard, wasps have been known to build their nests in them, even with eggs present. The easy fix involves rubbing slippery soap on the interior roof to make it hard for the wasps to affix their nest material. Overall, it's certainly been a big year for wasps, and any time birds are faced with an overabundance of a given food item, they do tend to take advantage of it. Let's hope so in any case. If I had to choose one bird that created a lot of buzz among North American birders in the summer of 2023, it would have to be the roseate spoonbill. At least two showed up in southern Quebec, another as far west as Wisconsin. The last time a roseate spoonbill was seen in the latter place was 1845. These birds are aptly named. While juveniles are whitish to a faded pink color overall, the adults are blessed with a brilliant rosy pink color, particularly on their wings and flanks. But the most striking feature of all is their bill, 
which looks like someone took a lengthy heron bill and flattened the end of it with a hammer. The filter feeding birds wave these bills, which are heavily endowed with sensory endings, from side to side while wading in shallow water to feel for crustaceans, small fish, and other tasty food items in the water. Standing about 30 inches high on somewhat longish legs, these wading birds with their football-shaped bodies and moderately lengthy necks bend over horizontally to forage for food. But here's the really interesting part of their appearance in the north though. They normally breed throughout Florida and the Carolinas, but more and more they're being seen further north. Over the last century or more, at least 10 to 15 specimens have now been recorded in southern Canada and as far west as Minnesota. So what's driving the birds northward? The usual thought is that their navigation systems have somehow malfunctioned, or perhaps storms blew them northward. But if you guessed that climate change was implicated, you might be partly right. Apparently, rising coastal waters with ever-increasing amounts of salt in their usual southern habitats are making it hard for the birds to find food there. Alternatively, in an ironic twist, it might also be due to ongoing recurring patterns of exceptional breeding seasons where excessive numbers of fledged youngsters mean that some simply have to head to northern climes to minimize competition. And of course, to the great delight of bird watchers up there. doesn't have downy woodpeckers at their feeders. They might be the smallest woodpeckers in North America, but they're certainly the most widespread. They vary in sizes geographically. Northern downy woodpeckers are larger in size than their southern brothers. The first thing that came to my mind was uh, Vikings versus Romans. It's super easy to identify males and females. So male downy woodpeckers have that red patch on their head and the females don't. And if you have a hard time distinguishing male uh, hairy and male uh, downy woodpeckers, again, check out the red patch. So hairy woodpeckers patch is uh, split into two and the downy's uh, patch is all connected. If you see both male and female downy woodpeckers on your property, can you please keep an eye on them and watch where on the tree they forage? Scientists say that males tend to forage higher up on the tree on branches and kind of smaller diameter limbs, whereas females stick to the trunk a little bit lower than the males. There have been exceptions here in Quebec especially, so I'm really curious to see what happens on your property. Contrary to popular belief, downy woodpeckers don't go for healthy trees. They prefer dead and uh, rotting trees. Beetles, larvae and other insects are their favorite many, but they're quite happy with berries and peanuts, suet nuggets and suet. I mean, I've watched them at my feeders for hours. This year I had a downy woodpecker emptying my hummingbird feeders. They roost in cavities every single night. So even if you've had a birdhouse but haven't been successful at having other birds nest in it, don't despair. Downy woodpeckers are most likely using them for roosts. You can actually put up more birdhouses for the winter to help them roost during those cold nights. There's nothing unusual about their breeding habits. They start breeding May, June, depending on where they are geographically. They have one brood per season three to eight eggs. Youngsters do stay with their parents for quite some time. Have you ever seen adults bring their kids to your bird feeders and show them how they work? So cute. Well, plovers and lapwings turn out to be a rather tough photo contest. And before we check out the top five, I wanted to talk about how to pronounce the word plover. There's been a lot of discussion whether it's a plover as in a lover or a plover as in rover. The general consensus is plover. Now the top five. Here's the third place. 
the second place and the grand prize winner congratulations everybody since halloween is in october we thought we would dedicate our october photo contest to crows and ravens all right everyone that's it that's all for now as you can see my dog has just walked up to me she's ready for her walk i've got my binoculars we're gonna go check out which birds are still around take care everyone i'll catch you in two weeks